So welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Clary. I'm the program manager, water program manager at Clean Water Action and Clean Water Fund. And I want to welcome you to our Environmental Flows and Floodmar webinar. Um, we're doing this in response to a lot of questions that we're getting and that I certainly have about how groundwater recharge in the age of stigma actually works and what and how we ensure that we have sufficient in-stream flows to protect those beneficial uses. So we invited a, several experts to give us an overview of some of these issues today. So I just want to welcome Stacy Sullivan of Sustainable Conservation is going to talk to us about Floodmar. Sam Bolin Bryan, who used to be in the Sigma division of the State Water Board and is now in the Division of Water Rights, which is great because he knows everything now. And Pablo Garza, the legislative analyst for the Environmental Defense Fund. So hopefully we're going to get a greater level of knowledge and understanding through today's meeting. meeting and we're leaving plenty of time at the end to have a discussion. So I hope that everyone sticks around to, to talk about it so we can get an understanding of what we know, what we don't know, what questions we still have, and where we, how, we, how folks want to move forward. Anyway, I'd like to start by saying hello, Stacy. Maybe we can pull up your screen and you can, we can start by learning all about Floodmar. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, okay. Um, it, I'm, uh, I hope my screen is, avail is, is showing for everyone. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, uh, so I just need to adjust something on my end here. Okay. Sorry about this. I'm not a, I'm not a pro at, at uh, uh, PowerPoints. Um, yes, uh, my name is Stacy Sullivan. I'm the policy director at Sustainable Conservation, which is a conservation organization that tries to work collaboratively uh, with a range of partners in order to solve difficult environmental problems. Uh, I would like to sort of start with a disclaimer. Uh, you will see uh, the California Department of Water Resources identified at the bottom of this first slide. I would like to make it clear that I am not here representing DWR. Um, but since I am charged with sort of giving a, a, what I hope is a relatively objective overview about what Floodmar is, what it hopes to be, and what it's been doing so far, uh, we, we do have some materials from DWR to, 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 uh, to, to work with. Uh, sustainable conservation is, we've been involved in uh, the work on recharge it, both uh, policy area, but primarily in the field and primarily with on-farm recharge since 2011. And largely as a result of that, uh, I and several of my colleagues uh, were, were asked to participate in the uh, research advisory committee uh, that Floodmar put together and has been meeting over the last half year or so. Uh, so, uh, so the text here is pretty self-explanatory. This is the, the sort of the official definition of Floodmar, uh, using high flows uh, for managed aquifer recharge on ag lands, working landscapes, and natural managed lands. I'd like to take a couple of minutes to talk about what Floodmar is not. Floodmar is not Sigma. <laughs> Yet obviously there's a relationship between Floodmar's goals and Sigma. But Floodmar looks to have a much wider scope of activity that covers the entire state and deals with recharge, uh, but recharge for multiple benefits, including uh, flood management and uh, habitat, uh, as, as well as, as water supply itself. Uh, it is not, or it is not intended to be a DWR program. DWR obviously has been the, the instigator of it and uh, the, 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 the main organizing force on it so far, but the intention is that it become a multi-stakeholder enterprise that is uh, basically giving a range of stakeholders information on research, data, and tools that will make individual Research, recharge projects more successful. 
Uh, finally, uh, FloodMar is not about creating and implementing individual projects. That's going to be up to others. Uh, FloodMar's goal is to provide guidance and tools to the people who are going to be doing those projects to um, be able to do it successfully. So, uh, some other thing, one other thing that FloodMar is not is a one size fits all approach to recharge. Uh, the idea is to realize the full potential of recharge while protecting uh, water rights and environmental interests. It's going to take a lot of efforts in a lot of places uh, at a wide range of scales from single fields to watersheds. Uh, what we have on the screen here on the upper left, you've got a levee setback uh, for floodplain reconnection. Uh, that obviously there are habitat benefits there, but it can also be a flood management tool. Uh, the uh, below that uh, we have habitat on fallowed lands. Uh, so th this obviously is is not the recharge per se is important, but the habitat is an important value as well. Uh, to the right uh, up above you have recharge on active farmland. Uh, which can be very effective if the soils are correct and the crops are correct and work is going on to determine what where those are. And finally, you have large scale projects for recharge on fallowed or converted ag lands. Uh, things that aren't included in this slide that are also under consideration and discussion are urban projects, including runoff, uh, reservoir reoperation, headwaters restoration and a number of other projects. So as you can see, the idea is to cover a wide range of projects throughout the state. So now the, the process that, that Floodmore has been, been pursuing. Uh, as you see it on the slide, it was proposed by DWR and the graphic on the left there indicates the different regions or different areas where Floodmar projects could occur. Uh, we have, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm saying Floodmar projects. I mean, projects informed by Floodmar should, should be the way that I properly say that. Going from reservoirs, floodplains, flood bypasses, orchards, active farmland, fallow fields, recharge basins. There are probably some others that we're leaving out there. The, um, the initial impetus was from DWR, but then the idea was to create this research advisory committee. The research advisory committee was primarily meant to be a source of technical information. I was the co-chair of the policy and legal subcommittee, which was really kind of an outlier we, in, in that regard, but uh, a lot of people with, with various range of technical knowledge about aspects of, of, of groundwater recharge and policy. Uh, the idea was, as it says, to develop decision support information. And the way that, that the group went around about doing that was to think in terms of what we know now, where the gaps in that knowledge are in terms of research, in terms of data, and in terms of tools and what strategies can be pursued in order to fill those gaps. Uh, the project, I know I just said that, that Floodmar was not about projects, but in this particular case, we're talking about pilot projects throughout the state that are providing information and allowing some of the strategies that the research advisory committee comes up with to be tested in the field. So it, it, they, they are basically trial projects. What we have, the, the original Floodmar documents created these implementation factors. These are basically the, the, the breaking down the subject areas and the basic questions that someone who did want to do a recharge, a recharge project should be asking themselves and answering uh, and seeking answers from the, the necessary, from the appropriate uh, uh, authorities, so to speak, or, or ref resources. Uh, like I said, they're basic questions. You can see, uh, I, I'm not going to read them all, but I, I, I know that the, the um, might be hard to, to, to look at the bullets underneath those questions, but what those are, those are different aspects uh, that were identified as being 
what should be part of the answer? What are the things that should be investigated in order to, to, to answer all of these questions? The, um, this list has changed uh, and probably will continue to change as, as the process continues. But the, uh, and uh, recently uh, at, at the last meeting of the, our, of, of the RAC, of the Research Advisory Committee, it was recognized that political support was a very important thing to add to this list as well. And we're talking about political support, not just from Sacramento in terms of the budget or the legislature or the administration, but, but local government support as well. And in some ways that's actually going to be more important in a lot of these contexts. This is not a sequential list it's, and, and not all of these subject areas or questions are going to be applicable to every project that comes along. So the implementation factor structure basically helped to identify what the areas that the research advisory committee were going to be looking at in terms of what the informa what information was available and what information needed to be uh, provided or discovered in order for things to go forward. And that led to the creation of the subcommittees. The subcommittees, there are 13 of them. Uh, the subcommittees were created in order to, excuse me, in order to break the range of issues into discrete, play, into discrete pieces, to be able to focus the experience and the knowledge of the participants in the, in the rack. Uh, the, the subcommittees were co-chaired. There, there was a DWR co-chair, but there was also a, a co-chair from, <clears throat> from outside of DWR. Uh, I was the co-chair of number 12 there, which uh, it's a long name. It was shortened to the policy and legal subcommittee. And so the, the, the role of these subcommittees was to look in, within their particular subject area and to identify the gaps in research data and tool needs. That process uh, resulted in each subcommittee identifying 10 gaps, so uh, which, which were considered to be the most important. Uh, then after those initial gaps were, were identified, the subcommittees then further refined it down to 39 priority actions or three actions per subcommittee. Uh, I, I, at this point, I, 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 I haven't been trying to editorialize on this. I'm trying to just sort of give the, the facts, so to speak. Uh, but I would say that, that uh, sort of going back to what Jennifer was saying at the beginning of the presentation, one of the three priority actions identified by the policy and legal subcommittee was basically ascertaining what water is actually available for recharge after water rights and environmental needs are accounted for. Uh, that is knowledge that we don't really have right now and we feel is a priority in terms of obtaining. So after those 130 gaps were identified, they were applied to the eight implementation factors to figure out where, which out of those uh, questions and those, those uh, aspects of the questions these different priorities would fall. And the result of that action is the FLOODMAR research and data plan. The FLOODMAR research and data plan was released to the uh, members of the RAC on July 31st for internal review in order to make sure that it's complete and accurate uh, from the perspective of the subcommittees. Uh, the plan will then be posted publicly on September 25th. There will be a formal rollout on October 28th and 29th. The first day will be devoted to the scientific questions and the second day to larger questions, policy questions, uh, involvement questions, further actions that need to be taken and more of a forum situation. After that meeting, the next step that Floodmar, the, the Floodmar organization foresees is the formation of a large committee basically to prioritize the priorities. Uh, 
it's, it's 30, you know, 39, eight implementation factors. It's important, particularly when we try to figure out what an actual strategy is for moving forward in uh, making recharge a valuable tool in these multiple uh, subject areas, both in water supply itself, but also in terms of flood management, habitat, and water quality in some cases. What, what out of those should we be paying the most attention to? Practitioner, uh, water management practitioners will be involved in that. Members of the community, including, uh, we hope, a wide range of uh, representatives from uh, disadvantaged or impacted communities will be part of that. Advocates, uh, and we hope that that really turns into a robust discussion of the uh, of, of how how to actually move forward once these technical tools uh, and and gap filling efforts have been put in place. I will close with one editorial comment. Uh, in the course of reviewing uh, this material, uh, both uh, both my colleagues and I were struck by the fact that uh, there has not been a great deal of engagement with communities up to this point. One of the explanations for that, I believe, has been that the focus has been on uh, dealing with these more technical aspects of the, um, uh, the, 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 the questions raised for the research advisory committee. That being said, <laughs> Um, I, 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 I particularly, I, I individually uh, and our group feels that that's been a weakness and we're very definitely looking forward to the committee process as a place to redress that and to, to bring that dimension of the, of, the, of the issue into full engagement with Floodmar. And that's what I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really wonderful, Stacey. Um, so we're open for any clarifying questions and I will, before we move on to our next presentation, and I actually have two, mm -hmm. and I think I may know the answer since you didn't mention it. Is there funding for any of this research? Um, and is there a timeline for conducting any of it? The, the, there has been funding available for the uh, RAC process itself. Uh, funding for the research is not available at this time. And it should be uh, stated that the, the hope is, at least, that the funding is not just, this is part of it not being a DWR program. The funding is not just coming from DWR. We're hoping that it, com it comes from other, other agencies, but also entities outside of government who have an interest in uh, achieving successful groundwater recharge. Uh, and that process is beginning. Uh, and uh, the, the, the hope is that that timeline, that, that, that at least some of that funding will be identifiable and in place by the time of the rollout in October, uh, certainly uh, in 2020. But it is all... It's at a formative point right now. Okay. And if people want to learn more, they could go to the Floodmar website. They can go to at the Floodmar website. The... Yes, I would say they go to, go to the Floodmar website, but um, uh, certainly if, if anybody has any particular questions about anything I've said, uh, I, my, I, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to, to, to answer questions myself. My email address is ssullivan at suscon.org. Great. And I see no other questions for Stacy, So I'm going to move on to Sam Bolin Bryan, if we could pull up his screen. And Sam has um, an interesting task ahead of him in 20 minutes or less. He's going to tell us everything we need to know about water rights and how to resolve them for both groundwater recharge and environmental beneficial uses. Are you ready for that, Sam? Yes. Thank you for setting the bar low. 
Um, can you hear me okay? Absolutely. And can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Uh, awesome. So my name is Sam Bolenbryan, and I recently joined the Division of Water Rights at the State Water Resource Control Board. Uh, today I'm going to talk about briefly about a couple of different things that the State Water Board and specifically the Division of Water Rights is working on. Uh, I'm also going to kind of provide a bit of a distinction between these efforts, uh, hopefully that's clear. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the Environmental Flows Work Group a little that has just recently been kicked off, as well as the Division's efforts, uh, as the title of the slide says, to streamline some of our underground storage uh, water rights permitting processes. And uh, with me in the room uh, also is Amanda Montgomery and Katie Lee, and they're uh, really leading the charge on a lot of this, and I'm just due to a quirk of timing doing the presentation today. Um, but they're really the experts, and so they're going to help me answer questions. Um, first, getting into the Environmental Flows work group and the, uh, the underground storage water rights. I've, like to overuse Venn diagrams, and I think this is a good one. Uh, you'll note I don't have these circles overlapping a ton. And so they are two distinct efforts uh, kind of coming out of the division of water rights, uh, but sort of two different objectives and, and different staff working on them. That being said, we uh, all kind of work in the under Eric Ekdahl, and so we are coordinating and kind of discussing different thoughts uh, of different pieces of our relative programs, um, but we are definitely not the same, so I want to kind of draw that out as a distinction. And kind of talking first about the Environmental Flows Work Group, um, they were recently formed, uh, kind of this year, I believe, and the mission they kind of came up with is to advance the science of environmental flows assessment and its application for supporting management decisions aimed at balancing natural resource needs with consumptive water uses. And so that's kind of a broad uh, run on sentence, but the objectives, I think, clarify a little bit what they're trying to do. And really at the at the top level, it's a, they're trying to provide a forum for communication. So there's a kind of a, a number of uh, resource agencies at the table, uh, including the State Water Board, Division of Water Quality, our Division of Water Rights, the Department of Water Resources, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then some of the, the federal entities as well, like the U.S. Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the USGS, uh, and a, a number of other people. So it's it's really this this forum for these different agencies uh, that have a nexus to the question of environmental flows to kind of gather, uh, share notes, and try and come up with kind of a consistent and defensible framework for developing environmental flows. Another outcome that's kind of an objective of the group is to They'll develop sort of a clearinghouse for tools and data related to environmental flows, so uh, like data sets of where environmental flows have been established, the different types of data that may be used to develop new environmental flows, and the type, of, essentially the type of information that could be used to plug into the this consistent and defensible framework. I think an important thing to note is that they are not establishing environmental flows as part of the effort. So they're not kind of going to specific water bodies and saying here is the environmental flows needed. They are more of just a forum so that the different agencies working on this topic can can kind of combine their thinking and make sure they're they're kind of on the same page as they proceed in their individual efforts. And so I just kind of wanted to to draw that distinction out a bit. The environmental flows work group is is not uh, kind of establishing prescriptive guidelines or anything like that. It is not even developing policy recommendations. It is kind of a place for all the the technical wizards to to combine their thoughts and, and bounce ideas off of each other. And so um, that's sort of the the main thrust of this group. And it is it is open to the the public, and it meets quarterly. At, I think they've only had uh, a few meetings so far, um, and so these are the kind of the dates and times. Uh, it's sort of a, a sub. The, the group is underneath the umbrella of the Water Quality Monitoring Council, so that's sort of where it's housed at the State Water Board. Um, it has 
two co-chairs, Dan Schultz, he's within the, the board's division of water rights, and uh, Robert Holmes uh, with CDFW. And so there uh, are their email addresses if you want to, to dive into the specifics. They're, they're also kind of working on getting a, a website and other materials kind of more widely available, but it is still sort of a new group. And so if you're uh, really interested, I recommend showing up to the meeting um, or uh, at least first maybe reaching out to, to Dan and Robert uh, to see how you can kind of tie in. So uh, I work and sit near Dan in the office, and so we talk on uh, a number of different things. And this is where we've been coordinating a bit with wh where I've been uh, working more with Amanda and Katie on these underground storage water rights. And so the uh, rest of the presentation is going to talk a little bit about that, and, and we'll touch a bit on where we've shared notes with, with uh, Dan and the Environmental Service Work Group. And so getting into underground storage water rights, uh, I think there's the two terms are worth kind of checking in on first, like what is a water right or do, do you need one? Uh, if you're diverting water from a surface water body, say, yes, you need a water right. And then why this term uh, underground storage? And that's just kind of the, the framework provided by California water rights law. Uh, a bunch of other Western states call it conjunctive use. It's where you're kind of managing together surface water and groundwater. Uh, a lot of people call it recharge, and there's also the the flood mire, uh, things like that. But um, the framework from the water right side is underground storage, and so that's why I'm kind of that's where the title of these these slides come from, and it's a bit of background. And so Jennifer, that is my overview of water rights for California. Uh, <laughs> as you teed up. Um, there's a couple of different ways to get this authorization to divert the water. Uh, really, there's only two ways right now, and it's you can get a temporary permit, or a, we call them a standard water right. The temporary permit lasts for 180 days, so it's only a temporary authorization. And so because it's temporary, there's uh, specific findings that the, the water code, the statute lays out. Uh, the board has to find that there's no unreasonable effect on fish or injury to other uh, legal users of water. Uh, the applicant is demonstrating an urgent need. The process is subject to the California Environmental Quality Act, and there's an, a noticing process, and parties have the opportunity to submit objections to the temporary permit. And because it's sort of based on an urgent need and it only lasts for 180 days, it's not a permanent authorization to divert water. The, the processing is typically faster. It's not kind of exactly the same criteria as used for a standard water, right? And this is to kind of facilitate, uh, you know, getting water when folks need it. The uh, more traditional process for obtaining uh, the authorization that a permanent project to divert water is to get a standard water, right? So once you get a water right, it is permanent, uh, and it, the key thing there is it secures a priority date for the project. And so the water right system in California is all based around what's your pri if especially if, if you are an appropriator, uh, which means you've gotten a permit from the state water board, essentially. You uh, need to know your date, your uh, spot in the pecking order for when there's water available or for when there's dry, it determines who's kind of shut off and who's not. So when you file for a standard water right, it's permanent. You get to uh, secure a priority date that you can, you can use relative to others, against others. The board has to make a finding that there's unappropriated water available. And so that's kind of one of the big tasks for us when processing these. The, a standard water right is also subject to CEQA, and it's also subject to, to noticing and protests. And protests have to be resolved before a permanent water right can be issued. Uh, and typically, processing of permanent water rights is slower in the order of years. So these are really the two pathways that have been available um, for, for quite a while. And there's uh, what I'm going to go into in a little more detail is some work on the standard water right. Um, but it, it's worth noting that people are trying to generate kind of more options. And so one of the ones that's out there that Pablo will go into a little more is another option for a temporary permit. And so this is distinct from the standard water right. It's a, a new process that AB 658 is, is proposing, where a temporary permit would last for five years instead of 180 days. 
What I'm going to get into is a little more detail is what uh, the Division Water Rights has been working on, which is a streamlined water right for diverting high flows. And so it's not a streamlined name yet. We'll, we'll come up with a cool acronym uh, at some point, I'm sure. Uh, but it is a it's, it's a subset of the standard water right process, so it would be a, a permanent water right. Uh, it would be subject to the same statutory and regulatory requirements as normal permit processing. It's not, uh, we're not kind of changing the law or anything on this. What we are doing is clarifying uh, how to expedite these applications and how we're going to prioritize our efforts and what could help us prioritize our efforts uh, when processing these applications. So what does this mean, the streamlined permitting? It can kind of be bucketed down into a few different pieces. Uh, applicability or eligibility, uh, simplified water availability analysis, uh, some accounting kind of concepts, and then touching on a, a few things maybe that uh, would tie to the, the flood more, more concepts of how we can do some umbrella permitting to kind of facilitate a bit of scalability in these recharge efforts. Getting into the eligibility of what's going to help us kind of um, expedite the processing is if the project is located in a Bulletin 118 basin, which is the basins uh, for, for Sigma, if the applicant is a local agency or a, a groundwater sustainability agency, which is a, a type of local agency, if the uh, applicant uses this kind of simplified methodology for the water availability analysis, that's what the WAA stands for, if they've completed CEQA, um, so they can't kind of come in with a, a project half-baked, it, it kind of needs to be thought out and they need to have completed the environmental document documentation. And then they're only proposing to divert flows uh, during the, the winter months where flows are typically higher. And so these are kind of the, the gates you can think of, and this is what's going to help us uh, kind of speed up some of our process. It sort of addresses some of the uh, typical delays in the processing time. Uh, on our side. Uh, getting into the simplified or streamlined water availability analysis, I think this is really the, the meat of what we're proposing. And essentially what we're saying is that the applicant uh, will divert flows that are above the 90th percentile flows. And so this is this 90th percentile is a metric uh, that the USGS relies on uh, based on a calculation of, of 30 years for a gauge. Uh, they actually pre-calculate these numbers, and so they're already available for each gauge from the, the USGS's website. And so in addition to that criteria, which is sort of a, a threshold for showing that high flows are present, uh, the project will only propose to divert 20% of the flows during this period. And so what that means is when there are high flows, the project will still bypass 80% of the flows. And so where this kind of number comes from, why 20%? And this is where we get into a bit of coordination with uh, Dan Schultz and the folks working on the in environmental flows, is uh, a recommendation to rely on uh, a paper developed uh, by Brian Richter, who is formerly with the, the Nature Conservancy, has kind of been involved in fisheries issues for a long time. Uh, he came out with kind of a, a presumptive standard for environmental flow protection. It's a, it's a paper from 2011 uh, and still something he stands by. It's just we need some kind of simplified approaches for for developing environmental protections. And within that, that paper, this is where we got the 20% the from, where uh, if you're diverting kind of 20% of the, the flows, then you may see some changes in structure, but minimal changes in ecosystem functions. Um, and so the applicant would do still a bit of analysis, compare uh, this 90th percentile number that they, they get from the USGS against um, kind of the existing demands uh, within their watershed and also the uh, environmental needs within the watershed. So if there's any kind of in-stream flows that have been established or any other decisions or orders that the board has done, then they'd compare those against the 90th percentile just to make sure that the 90th percentile threshold is much higher. Uh, an alternate pathway to show that water is available and that the board can proceed with issuing the permit is that the project will only divert when there's flood conditions threatening health and safety. 
Uh, I have an example graph of just what this would look like. And so the gray on the screen are, are the 90th percentiles. They're calculated on a daily basis for each day by the USGS. Um, the, the blue are flows that would have to be bypassed by the project, and the orange are flows that uh, could be diverted by one of these high flow projects and, and recharged or, or stored underground. Um, so in a wet year, there would be opportunities to divert flows. And then in a dry year, as you can see, all of the flows are lower than the 90th percentile, and so the project wouldn't be able to divert anything. And so it wouldn't be something that's used every year, uh, but only when there's these kind of wet periods, they'd be able to take the tops off of the, the peaks. Uh, another piece is that is going to be important, has been touched on a number of times, is uh, that the water rights uh, have to have a beneficial use. And so uh, we're kind of laying out, we're proposing to lay out some suggestions on how to show beneficial use, and that it could be integrated with the the sigma effort a bit. Uh, and so it's accounting for how much water was, is left underground, how much is withdrawn, uh, that type of information that a groundwater sustainability plan will already be collecting is something that could be relied on as part of the uh, annual reporting and accounting requirements uh, that come along with uh, having a water right. And finally, the last piece is that this, this idea of uh, umbrella permitting. Uh, so GSAs, the groundwater sustainability agencies, can acquire uh, surface water rights already. That was kind of laid out in the statute. And so if a GSA were to kind of obtain one of these permits, they could have kind of many points of diversion and then administer the landowner kind of level processes of who's kind of diverting water onto their fields or not on any given day. And the GSA would still be responsible for meeting kind of the protections and terms and conditions of the water right that was issued by the State Water Board. Um, so when is this happening? When are we kind of rolling it out? Uh, the, we're working on finalizing the materials and kind of getting uh, a website ready now. We're, we're hoping to get it uh, by the middle of September, um, barring unforeseen kind of obstacles. Uh, I think we're on a good track, but I, you know, it's recognized it's a, it may shift a bit. Uh, and also recognize that this, this process is um, not a change in regulation, it is a change in how we're prioritizing our, our workloads, and so it is going to be case by case. And it's going to be something we're going to be working with everyone along the way. And so uh, as so no one's filed for these yet under this kind of streamlined permanent water right process we've laid out. And so it is going to evolve a bit as, as we go and kind of learn uh, how well it works for, for everyone. Um, we're happy for to hear feedback and questions and kind of looking forward to the discussion uh, at the end of this webinar. Here's some staff contacts if you have more specific questions. And that finishes my presentation. Well, that is really awesome. Um, so we have, uh, we have a question for you, but I'm going to, Justin, I'm going to let that wait till our discussion at the end. And I think we're just going to ask, as a clarifying question, the USGS stream gauge data. Yes. How many streams, how many California streams and waterways does that, do those cover? Um, definitely not all of them. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Uh -huh. um, we're, put, as part of this kind of package of, of materials, we're uh, going to put out some like kind of a guidance document on the water availability analysis specifically. And so there are kind of options for uh, estimating or combining different gauges or kind of looking at a nearby gauge if your kind of water source doesn't have a USGS gauge on it with 30 years of data. Okay. Thank you very much. We could always do with more gauges. Um, cool. Well, thank you. Um, you did a pretty good job of uh, covering water rights and a short period of time. And I don't think we have any lawyers on the phone, so I think that makes it a little easier. Yeah. So we're and I we have a bunch of questions for our discussion, but before that we went to introduce Pablo Carza with um, Environmental Defense Fund, who's going to talk about sort of the legislative landscape and what's been going on and how that might um, 
how that kind of leads to some of the policy decisions that are being made or discussions that are being had. So take it away, Pablo, and continue to put in your questions after this presentation. We're going to be starting our Q&A, and I'll start with the questions that are already in the queue. Great, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm, it's Pablo Garza. I'm the California Political Director with uh, Environmental Defense Fund Ecosystems Program here in California. Uh, you know, we're an international nonprofit working on a lot of different issues, but here in California, our water team is very focused on implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and creating tools and options to comply and you know, realize the vision of a sustainable future, sustainable water future in California through this important program. Um, and groundwater recharge is something we've engaged in the last couple of years. It's kind of been a hot topic, obviously, in policy discussions and elsewhere. Um, so I was going to, um, I'll talk about kind of two policy issues that you know, Sam already touched on this, but the issue of groundwater recharge as a beneficial use has come up. And you know, before I go there, one of my colleagues reminded me that Sigma's five-year anniversary is rapidly approaching uh, next month. And, and I think um, in a lot of ways, it's getting very real. As the first plans that you know, we're seeing draft plans and the first plans they do next January. Um, so I think that's, it's, I think this, this conversation about groundwater recharge and other aspects of, uh, to comply with the law will, is going to continue to kind of bubble up and, and be a, 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 you know, an active dialogue going forward. Um, and so groundwater recharge as a beneficial use has come up, you know, going back, you'll see in the, on my next slide, there's been a number of proposals on this, uh, legislative proposals to address this issue um, going back a few years. And I, I just put water code section 1242 there. You know, I'm not going to read it, but this is kind of the current. This is the current law dealing with diversion of water for underground storage. Um, and I think one of the important pieces of this, if you, it allows you to divert water for for recharge or storage if you designate a beneficial use for um, you know how that water will be used at a later you know when it's pumped back up or if it's you know underground. And I think that's that has been a little tricky in some cases, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I you know, I haven't been a fan of some of the proposals that have come forward. Um, and I I think you know, and so here's a list of the policy proposals, uh, and you can see I'll go I'll actually skip to the bottom. Maybe six four seven was the first one um, by Susan Eggman from kind of the Stockton area, and you know. She, she basically wanted to delete uh, the forfeiture provisions that apply to groundwater rights. Basically, it's kind of use it or lose it within five years, um, and it was trying to remove that, uh, you know, that that pro, uh, I don't know, provision as applied to groundwater recharge. Um, and I think a lot of you know a lot of us, particularly in the NGO community, objected to that. I think we feel like that um, keeping you. Know, Making sure you use that water within five years is an important protection, so individuals don't try and hoard water underground, or sort of, or you know, it doesn't create a perverse incentive to you know, be more inefficient in your use of water. Um, you know, AB 647 didn't go very far. Eggman tried again with AB 1427, very similar approach, and that didn't pass through. Then Joaquin Arangula from Fresno picked it up uh, last year. And he started kind of in the same place, playing with the beneficial use, and then it, it sort of evolved into a, a new permit, which I'll talk about in a second. And then, um, but that bill didn't get across the finish line last year. And then, you know, fast forward to this year, Eggman reintroduced a similar, based on the bill she had before, dealing with beneficial use designation. Um, a lot of us engaged, uh, sort of cautioning against that approach. And then Rambula had his bill that basically created a new five-year permit, as Sam described. And so it went in a very, it, not a very, but it went in a different direction. Um, and I just say, I think that I've heard kind of the last few years about, you know, from different stakeholders that if we change the benefit, you know, this, make this small tweak in law that has broad implications on the beneficial use and, and allow underground storage or recharge to be a beneficial use, 
these projects will magically it will just start happening. They'll be very they'll become very easy. And and I think I take issue with that. I think this is issue a red herring, a more of a red herring than a, a real barrier, um, you know, to getting more groundwater recharge done. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that in discussion if people are interested. But I, I think there's been a number of reports, and you know, when you look at these efforts, there's a, a lot of issues from accounting to infrastructure uh, to water availability that really, I think, constitute more important barriers. And I think you know, my bias, obviously, is to not mess with this section of law because I think of the perverse potential and your perverse incentive it's had. And I can, again, happy to answer questions on that front. But um, I'll move forward. I, groundwater recharge permitting is another policy issue that's come up. You know, obviously, water getting a new water right is a lengthy process and, and um, takes a lot of time and money. You know, Sam's already touched on this. But um, I think kind of the, the two paths that uh, we have today is the temporary 180-day permit and then a, a full, um, you know, a full permanent water right. Um, see, I think I got this out of, I think I'm going to go come back to my slide executive order and I'll go straight to AB658 by walking around you. So this is one of the bills I recently just discussed. And it's a, where it is, it's pretty far along in the legislative process this year. I expect um, it will pass through and make it to the governor's desk. And I think it will likely be signed into law. And I, I think for, you know, for just in full disclosure, EDF is now in support of this, this proposal. We've engaged a lot with the author's office over the past two years to get it in good, in good shape. And I know other stakeholders have as well. Um, but just as it, it kind of, it fill, will fill a gap. What we see is a gap in the kind of current pathways that Sam outlined, the 100 day, 80 day temporary permit and the, you know, the permanent rod, right? This is a, a, a five year, Temporary urgency permit. It's called. I call them groundwater recharge permits, but they're technically they're called temporary urgency permits. It requires, you know, it has protections for downstream water right holders, what, you know, to ensure that water quality objectives are met and you know, to protect fish and wildlife and other beneficial uses. These permits will have to go through CEQA, um, and it also has a provision requiring that the diversion the permit is consistent with the local groundwater sustainability plan, um, which I think is a really important provision as well. Um, so I think assuming this goes through, we'll, it'll create a third option uh, that will give stakeholders and, and, and those interested in this issue to, to get a more, you know, more certainty over a longer period of time. Um, I'll go back to this executive order B3917. Um, and this was initially issued, Governor Brown during the drought issued an executive order requiring a number of things, but it, it one of the specific to this discussion, it prioritized uh, these temporary groundwater permits and, and directed the state water board and other agencies to try and get these projects done. It also exempted the temporary permits from CEQA, which I think obviously is a, can be a controversial topic. Um, but you know, and and then you know, since the that order was it was issued first in 2015 and reissued in 2017, and it's currently still in effect for um, at least temp the temporary permits. Um, only nine permits have gone through the process. I, I shouldn't say only nine, but nine permits have gone through the process and. You know, four of those are by the Yolo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. They've, you know, they've gotten the permit. It's expired, and they've re-upped, um, you know, three times now. Um, and then I, you know, list out the other ones that have gotten these permits as well. But, um, you know, I think, you know, we, in 2017 when we had, I mean, the whole concept here is to take. I think the recharge applies in a number of contexts, but a lot, a lot of us have in mind is when we have a really wet year or wet winter and high flow events, you know, atmospheric rivers coming at us, we want to be prepared to divert water, put it on fields or in recharge facilities so we can recharge our aquifers and, and, and save that water for a later date when it's not, when it's dry or, you know, address subsidence issues. Um, but in 2017, 
when we had, I think, depending on what index you look at, it was the second or wettest uh, winter on record, second wettest or most or wettest. We had two of these temporary permits in place, and I, I think you know Yolo County Flood District was one of them. I think I don't think it was East Side. I forget who the other one. I thought there was one in Kings County, but nonetheless, um, it just suggests to me that we weren't taking advantage of the opportunity. And I think, not, and I think um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think we need to do better in going forward, particularly, you know, this is the hydrology of our futures, you know, wetter winters, less snow melt, you know, drier droughts, longer droughts. So I think we're gonna have to use this recharge as a tool to sort of take water when it's available, uh, as long as we're protecting, you know, all these uses and um you know store it for a later use when we're when we're facing scarcity so but uh, you know there's so we're we're basically talking about three avenues just to sum up um you know the temporary permit under existing law the permanent permit under existing law and then this sort of middle stopgap of ab 658 which um that will i think likely become law january 1st next year uh, I've already covered that slide. For more information on this topic, here's a couple of resources that I think are really helpful. I think PPIC had a good report um, last year, and then the Wheeler Water Institute at UC Berkeley also did a good kind of deeper dive on this specific, the, the recharge of the beneficial use question uh, last August, which I think is really helpful. And then um, State Water Resources Control Board has a great website with all this and a lot of this information on it as well. Um, and that's my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I, I put this picture up here. I, I think of this as groundwater recharge nirvana. That's where we want to get to, where we're, um, you know, we're taking advantage of high flow events and, and banking water for when we don't have it. So hope you'll share that vision and um, look forward to the discussion and questions. Thank you. Thanks, Pablo. So this has been a really good grounding, and I think that I have a lot of questions on it, but I think I am going to defer to our audience questions. And I want to start with Susan Rainier, who has asked if there are any plans to replace aquifer storage where subsidence has occurred. Um, and she cites substantial subsidence occurring in the valley. And is that storage now lost forever? Does anyone want to answer that question? No one's raising their hand. Well, if no one's going to raise their hand, I don't know. I'm going to call on someone. Sam used to be a Sigma person. I Can suppose I answer I that did. question? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was just unmuting myself before you called on me, so it was totally oh, cool. volunteer. <laughs> um, I don't think so, is the short answer. Um, and so with an asterisk on my answer that I'm an engineer and not a geologist, um, this, the storage space that was lost was, um, so when this, this collapsing was occurring due to overpumping, what was happening was that the, the clay areas uh, within that aquifer were uh, being depressurized and sort of collapsing. And so when you see subsidence, it's when these, the, the portion the portions of the subsurface that are these clay layers they're the ones that are actually collapsing so it's we are losing the storage space that was in those those clay areas however it's it's not like the entire aquifer is collapsing there is all of this other kind of alluvial fill material that's coarser and that's where a lot of the water is and so um i don't uh, getting kind of setting even setting that aside that you know it's it's not like we're losing kind of the core functioning storage space um, I don't know there's no way to kind of reverse subsidence one once these uh, kind of clay particles have realigned due to all of this pressure there's no way to like un, undo that does that help answer the question Jennifer um, yes and I would say that the few draft um, plans I've seen so far don't anticipate increasing storage to historic levels, but um, finding a way to reach sustainability, which probably includes additional dewatering of some aquifers. Um, so I have a, 
some questions for Stacy. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I don't know if you can see this question. One, yeah. There, so Justin has some questions about the who was on the committees, how they were chosen, and uh, well, you see, it, and how 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 were they chosen? Let's start with that. Who's on the committees? How were they chosen? Okay. Um, I I can't rattle off everybody who was on the committees right away, but I'd be glad to make that information available uh, through a uh, local government commission or somebody else. Um, uh, and uh, how, how they were chosen. Well, um, the, it was sort of a, 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 a cascading process. Uh, DWR, basically appointed two co-chairs of the Research Advisory Committee. One of them was uh, Romain Mainly from uh, DWR, and the other was my colleague, Daniel Mountjoy. Uh, they, who, so the idea was like right from the start that it not just be a D, DWR issue. Uh, those sub-chairs then uh, invited, identified it, and, and uh, identified and invited uh, the uh, people to be uh, co-chairs of the different subcommittees. Um, and like I said, I was, I was one of those co-chairs. Uh, and then uh, once that was established, then it became, basically it was like hands off at that point. It was up to each coach, each subcommittee, the co-chairs of each subcommittee to decide who they wanted to invite, how many people they wanted to invite, uh, and uh, really to be able to proceed with a, with a certain amount of autonomy uh, as far as, as that was concerned. Um, I, uh, I invited Pablo to be part of, of our subcommittee. Um, it was a very valuable one. Uh, so that, I mean, I, I, that's, basically how the members were selected. And I, I also noticed that he was asking about the, the sort of the big committee and then the subcommittee. Uh, the, the people on the big committee, the, 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 the rack itself, were all of the subchairs. Uh, and so, uh, plus Roman, Roman and, and, and Daniel. Uh, so not all the subcommittee members were part of the, of the big group, but they, um, uh, the, the co-chairs were there to represent, you know, the, the, the decisions and, and, and thoughts of their, their membership. Um, so, yeah. I'm kind of, I'm going to do the second half of his question, which is this, the outreach, it seems like it hasn't been, um, as broad or as public as it should have been. And sorry for synopsizing your question. Justin, mm -hmm. but how how moving forward has there been discussion or thought on how moving forward this process becomes more public? Because you said yourself that there was there was some shortcomings in outreach mm -hmm. and engagement. So mm -hmm. have you had discussions about how to make this more public moving forward? Uh I personally have had a couple, uh, and I know that that this has been going on. I know that that Daniel uh, has has been involved in them as well, and at, at least right now we're really looking to this committee process and sort of the prioritization of the priorities, so to speak, as as being uh, the place where the the participation can really be expanded. And we're, we're, you know, my hope certainly is that, that that's the direction that it's going to go. I can't tell you that for sure, but that is the way that the conversations have been pointing. Uh, you know, I, I like I said, I, you know, I, Justin, I can't, I can't speak for DWR, <laughs> you know, I, in terms of what the situation has been up till now. Great. I'm moving on to Sam now. And Sam, what does it mean to threaten health and safety and who decides when that point is reached? So this is Amanda. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, butt in for a minute on this one because we've been okay. talking a lot about it, about the health and safety flood trigger. So the first thing is, is that uh, we're trying to create the space there for the option of a health and safety flood trigger. 
but we are not here in water rights experts in flood control, and we'll be looking to flood control agencies to help give us input on that. Um, even the flood mark people might have thoughts, since that's really focused on flood um, actions. And you might wonder why we're not so involved in flood control actions. It's because uh, flood control, when they take water out of a channel simply for flood control, is not a beneficial use, so they don't receive water rights permitting. So that all kind of happens outside of us. When they're taking it out for flood control and then they also put it to underground storage and use it for groundwater recharge, then suddenly we're triggered. And we have a fact sheet that we developed about six months ago on that. Um, but for this, we're thinking of situations where uh, a diverter decides that they're going to be diverting out of a channel for this, um, basically at the time when downstream there's some kind of health and safety event happening. Um, and so we would look to um, the lead agencies at the um, flood control agencies to be making that call. So it could really be on a real-time basis is probably when um, the health and safety event is occurring. Um, they would have to have some sort of written documentation ahead of time that they would provide to us. So it would really be on a case-by-case -case basis to see how this would work. Uh, like I said, we're, we're creating the space for it in our proposal. How it's going to actually work out is going to play out um, on a case-by-case -case basis. But that's the idea behind it. So another follow-up question is, how did this uh, work in conjunction with large-scale hydrologic measures like the CDC flows, delta outflow, eight river index, imbalanced delta conditions. So is that something that's part of what we're going to see next month? Or do you feel like this is um, restricted to those um, groundwater sustainability agency boundaries? Um, so all water rights permitting actions, we have to consider the downstream flow paths and the impacts um, to the existing senior diverters and to in-stream needs um, that are along that flow path. So if these are happening in the Sacramento San Joaquin watershed, then obviously the projects are at the bottom and there are senior diverters along the way and in-stream needs along the way. So they'll have to be looking at that. Um, generally. Uh, there'll be a, there's a couple ways to address it. One is that the 90th percentile and 10 of 20 or 20 percent of the 90th percent of that approach is generally very protective. So we're really talking about the very tops of the hydrograph anyway, when there's very little chance for injury. But as Sam described, there's also this other procedure where they're going to look and see how much senior demand is occurring during that window, and then what what do we have on the books um, at the board for in-stream flow needs. Um, so there's those two factors that are happening. And I, I think part of the question that Justin has is, and maybe I'm reading between the lines, is just using something like that, uh, you know, the, the delta outflow or something. And so what's, what's mo more likely to play out is, um, like, there's kind of a, a potential for effects between wherever the, the project and the diversions are and, you know, the delta. And so that's where the... 20% number is coming in to ensure that we're not causing any kind of damage to the environment or uh, the ecosystem functions of these high flows. Um, what's kind of likely to occur, though, is that uh, within each of these water rights, they have terms and conditions. And some of the, the conditions may be uh, if the project is in the uh, Sacramento San Joaquin watershed, that there'd be some kind of bar of, in addition to um, the flows being above the 90th percentile, that the delta outflow is, you know, uh, sufficient to demonstrate that, like, all the demand within uh, the delta water users is, is being met. And so there's kind of simple metrics like that that uh, may need to be layered on just to make sure that there's no injury occurring. And if you look at our temporary permit that we've issued, the 180-day ones, those that are in the Sacramento San Joaquin watershed have already included conditions like those. And we coordinated with um, the projects with DWR and USBR before we developed those terms. So yeah, the, the examples on our website are a good place to, to check. Okay. So uh, I've got a couple more questions. Let's kind of see this. So uh, another concern that's been expressed by Felice is that, and this is for Sam, watershed needs, flood, flood flows are an important part of maintaining a watershed and stream flows. And I, how does the method you've described for IDing flows subject to diversion address the need for flood flows? 
So this is the uh, the way it's being addressed is through this, uh, this concept of only uh, diverting 20% of the available flows. And so uh, that kind of goes back to the uh, the 2011 Richter paper uh, and kind of part of the framework there of this presumptive standard that he put forth um, was this concept of kind of the sustainability boundaries where uh, not altering the kind of the natural flow uh, as a percentage too far from what it uh, normally would be. And within that, he uh, recommends that you know, up to 20% change is going to have minimal effects on the uh, kind of ecosystem functions of these these flows. And so whether it's high flows or, or low flows or any kind of part of the hydrograph, if you're not changing it by more than 20%, uh, you're uh, probably okay. Um, I kind of did a, a, a gut check on this. I uh, have talked with Brian Richter about it. Uh, and so he's, he's no longer with the Nature Conservancy, but he has worked with them for a long time. Uh, he also kind of developed a lot of the methodology around indicators of hydrologic alteration and those types of metrics to evaluate changes in stream flow. And so I kind of laid out the proposal of what we're thinking to him, and he said it sounded like a great idea, uh, that just this, this approach of relying on a presumptive standard uh, and not letting kind of the perfect be the enemy of the good uh, in this process will kind of allow it to proceed uh, pragmatically. And so um, it's still kind of case by case. So that's how we're, we're thinking of protecting the the functions, the ecosystem functions and services of the high flows is this 20% number. Does that help answer the question? Sure, but now I have a now I have a question that shows why this is such a difficult topic and why we are having this today because from another attendee, I have this thing, lots of people feel AB 658 has been so whittled down and heavily conditioned that there are questions about how helpful it will be. Um, it, the efficacy and reach of the board streamlined permitting process also appears quite limited. The reality on the ground is California needs a mass massive shift in the way we manage water with groundwater re recharge, a cornerstone of that. Um, if for example, if environmental advocates are generally against the storage in favor of sigma and adjusting climate change, recovering fish and maintaining and augmenting in-stream flows, drinking water, et cetera, then groundwater must be a major part of this. But our current direction on that is frankly a far cry. Vague fears of hoarding, for example, or of insufficient water and massive winter flood events for the ecosystem, the delta or downstream diverters, including the projects, seem very reactive with such micro steps it's very questionable whether we really are creating the legal structures necessary for that to occur. So I think he's saying that this is not going far enough. <laughs> I think that's so a, I guess I my, first, and then maybe yeah. Pablo could go, or Pablo, you want to go first? I, see. <laughs> I, I can yeah, see I, 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 I can I I can speak to this too, but why don't you go ahead, Pablo? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, thanks for the comment. I mean, I I and I've heard the critique of six five eight as you know, being not that helpful. Um, I'm not saying, you know, and, and we're not sponsoring that. We're in a position of support. And I, I mean, I'm not saying it's suggesting it's a panacea, but I think I'm very convinced that this focus on beneficial use uh, and changing that, that section a lot is a, is a distraction. And I think even if we got that change, I don't think it's going to accelerate our groundwater recharge efforts dramatically and you know folks will still have you know, you still will have to get a permit i think what you might see is an uptick in existing water right holders doing a, a change of use petition so they can designate recharge as one of their uses and then that potentially sets up a big war with downstream water users it's not even environmental groups it's the downstream you know lower junior priority folks who will be concerned about that um so i think i just think that's a you know not the way to go i think there's a number of pieces you know we've talk more about the policy, but a lot of different things need to be done here. And, you know, water availability, I, I think, is a big barrier. Accounting is a big barrier. Um, even if you could get a permit as a landowner to recharge, or you did get a permit to get, recharge very easily, um, you know, I think there's a disincentive right now because there's no certainty that that water is going to be like another pumper right now could take that out. Now, if signal comes online, I think that changes that, that dynamic. 
where you have an accounting system for the basin. So I, I think um, you know, there's a lot of difficult issues that need to be addressed here. And I, I think, um, you know, I think 658 is a step in the right di direction. And I, I think I agree with some of the other points Justin makes that you know, we need to do more of this and accelerate this. Um, but it's, you know, we're going to have to do a lot of technical work before we can get to kind of at scale. And I, I, you know, I think all the efforts of the water board and, and other stakeholders are helping us, you know, Pledmar are helping us put us in that direction. Uh, but they don't, you know, it, it's going to be a, a number, we have to work on a number of fronts um, to get different pieces of this done. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Happy to talk more. Let, let Sam and um, Stacy respond as well. Yeah, Stacy, I think this is a nice segue into the work you're doing. How much are you going to be able to refine these numbers, and how long is it going to take to get to that? Uh, well, um, you know, it's uh, I'm, I'm I'm certainly encouraged to hear about the the um, the, the 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 work that that that's begun with um, the Environmental Flows Working Group, but um, I, I feel like we. One of the things that's important, and one of the things that I, I quite frankly, that we're advocating and, and hoping we can get from through the the, the governor's port, uh, uh, water resilience portfolio is a is a significant investment in moving these things forward. Uh, moving and, and what we think about what we're thinking about is there are there are issues that that cannot you you cannot avoid thinking about the environment, environmental impacts. You can't avoid the fact that there are existing water rights, but are there ways to front load the process uh, so that, uh, and, and this is one of, this is a big part of, of what the recommendations uh, in Floodmar are as well, is like, how do we bring the information together uh, as, as quickly as we can uh, in order to create what for better, what for lack of a better way of expressing it, you can, you can sort of create a programmatic approach to these events where you have, you know, we, we have, we have an understanding of, you know, at least within a watershed or say, what are, what are things that are common to various things in terms of what with the CEQA in terms of, of these various other things, can we develop programmatic approaches to these so that when these, Sort of transitory events occur, we'll be able to act in a in a in a prompt and, and efficient way. Our hope, uh, along with you know the 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 the, the, the what you know the in, what comes behind or what what the kind of commitments that actually come out of the resilience portfolio, is quite frankly that's one of our big hopes with Floodmar is that and. It's a long shot, as these things always are. Um, but the idea of addressing issues dealing with groundwater and groundwater recharge on a broad front and moving all of those issues forward together so that you really can come up with a, a more comprehensive approach that can get maybe closer to what Justin's talking about in terms of a reorientation of the way we think of groundwater and the way we see it, we, the way we see the use of groundwater in a kind of multi-benefit context. So I guess I'm agreeing with Justin, we, we do need to do it and we as Sustainable Conservation are looking at various ways that we can move that forward so that things actually happen. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so probably we could continue this back and forth for a while and we might come back to this, is it too much, is it too little? Um, so I, I have a quick question. I'm not sure I understand this, but I'll read it directly as, it asked, as it's asked. What about lateral movement? Hold on, I lost the question. What about lateral movement? Ah. I've lost it. Can you, you find it, Emily? Yeah. yeah. What about what about lateral movement of water banked 
any concern about retrieving banked water if it moves within aquifer in regards to credits? And so, Sam, maybe you can talk about how uh, recharged groundwater can be used or not used, or is that something that's more of a Pablo thing? I can take a stab at it and then Amanda can fill in the gaps that I missed. Um, but I think it, it kind of ties, the question ties in nicely with the part of the, the slides I had, where there really needs to be some kind of accounting framework um, for the underground storage project, whether it's specific to the water right or if it just kind of dovetails nicely with what Stigma will develop through the groundwater sustainability plans. There needs to be some way to kind of structure like how much did they put in the ground, how much is, is coming out of the system. Um, in terms of like water that's put into underground storage, it's not like the exact same molecules of water have to be withdrawn. Um, so you don't have to trace down, you know, are your your fugitive molecules of water running away from you and you uh, we can't have this process where it's it's fungible and so as long as you're kind of doing the accounting properly. Um, that it, it can kind of still uh, work out to like a overall a balanced budget. Right. right, and I would, this Amanda, I would say that you mentioned banks, and I guess when we deal with permitting, we're not really dealing with water banks per se, rarely, I don't know of any situation, but there are the water banks down in the Tulare and other areas, um, and water banks usually have figured out pretty exacting procedures as to lateral losses and kind of how much water is staying in there over time and then how much the party can eventually take out. So there's probably lessons learned from that uh, kind of well-developed industry for us, for us and, the G and to the GFPs as they're moving forward with their accounting approaches. Great. So I have another question that sort of teed off some of the comments we've gotten. And that is one of the things that struck me in your description of the environmental flow work groups is your statement that establishing environmental flows is not part of this effort. It, you'll forgive me if saying that raises a lot of confusion in some of us lay people. And I think one of the tensions in this whole effort is that for so many of the streams and rivers in the state, we don't actually have either adequate or any environmental flow criteria. So now that you're in water rights, Sam, or you can pass this off to your associates, when do we get actual minimum flow standards for um, the, all the streams in California, or even one more stream in California? I don't know if I have an answer to, to when, and uh, it's not to say that there, someone doesn't, but, but I don't know, know when. I do, um, it is and it's worthwhile, <laughs> a good comment, uh, this, this question of what is the environmental flows work group doing if it's not establishing environmental flows. And and maybe a, a better, like a more specific way to, to say that is this group is not kind of the one like implementing uh, environmental flow objectives. And and this is from, I'm a little bit of a lay person on this, but the, the flow objectives are the ones that have regulatory effect. Um, what the group is doing is more like developing frameworks for coming up with flow criteria. The flow criteria could be kind of taken uh, by the individual regulatory agencies to like implement these the flow objectives. So that's more of a process question. It doesn't get to your uh, question of um, like timing. Um, but I, I suppose you get clues on that by attending the work group and, and talking to all of the regulatory agencies that are kind of working on that issue. Okay, and is the, is, are those work group meetings publicly noticed somewhere? Do people need to get on the LIRIS list for the environmental quality, the water quality? The control, water quality monitor water quality. council. I would punch Thank Dan and, and send him an email. Uh, his contact was in, Dan Schultz, his okay. email was in the, we'll include that. in the, the slides. I'm, I think they have a LIRIS. I'm, I'm not sure. Our LIRIS is a, term for our listserv for those that don't know. Um, well, then we'll just have them contact Dan then. That's great. Yeah. Um, right. It's time. I think since it, we're almost out of time, so I do want to have it. I do want to give um, Emily a chance to pull up a resource guide 
that Local Government Commission has developed on this issue. And I also want to thank all of our speakers. It's, we really appreciate all this. And for our folks who are on the webinar, we're going to be sending out um, a follow-up email with a link to the recording of the webinar and some links for some things that were referred to today. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Emily. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and again, thank you to all of our panelists for a really thorough overview um, of this really complex topic. Just quickly want to point to something related to this topic and something definitely that Stacy mentioned in his presentation about the funding for some of these recharge projects. LGC has been working on a broad effort funded by the Resources Legacy Fund um, to put together this funding navigation tool. And this is a collection of local, regional, and federal funding options in a variety of subject areas. So this is a screenshot of the home page here, and a lot of the recharge projects would certainly fall under drinking water supply and quality, parks, wastewater management. Um, I can try to see if I'm tech savvy enough here to pull up the live tool itself. Um, you should still be able to see my screen. So as you're going through and selecting a particular project, um, for example, for parks, you'll then go through and you can see what programs are available, who is the funder. We've ranked awards based on the grant size, the total funds available, how competitive the fund is, so how many are awarded versus the number of proposals um, submitted, and the level of effort to apply. Um, so like I said, we have this for state funding, local funding, as well as federal funding. Um, in addition to this, LGC also offers direct technical assistance to apply for some of these funds. So if you go to our contact information, you can complete this um, and get a better sense of what projects you need help in applying for funds. And we have a separate team and a small amount of funding to help some smaller organizations directly apply for some of these funds. So please feel free to peruse through this site. We're constantly expanding the number of areas that we cover. Um, stormwater would be another great option in connection to these um, recharge projects potentially. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me after the webinar. I'll be sending out the recording, the notes, as well as a PDF of all the slides after the call. And I think that's it on my end. Jennifer, anything else you wanted to cover? Just to say, we're going to be sending out a survey asking for some feedback on the webinar, and we'd love to hear from you. And also, heard, just heard from Felice that you can um, log on through Lyris to the Water Quality uh, Monitoring Council and get onto the meeting. Okay. And so we'll send a link to that. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining this webinar today and hope you learned some new information and have some new ideas about ways you can implement this and take this back to your project work. Thank you all to our panelists again. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.